So the strength of the intermolecular forces are going to depend on the, the kinds of particles that we have on their structure. And then the state of matter at a given temperature will depend on the strength of those intermolecular forces. So the state of matter depends on the structure of the particles. If we have strong forces holding these things together, we're going to have high melting points and high boiling points. If those forces are weak, then we'll have low melting and low boiling points. So strong forces would be like a group of people wearing Velcro suits, right? And you, you stick to each other, and it's hard to move around. Here, if everyone was wearing, I don't know, Teflon suits or something, really slippery, right? You can just slide past each other, no big deal, right? These intermolecular forces are going to be really electric in, um, in nature, electrostatic. They're interactions between charges. So we've got actual charges in an ionic compound. We have partial charges in polar molecules. And we also have temporary charges even on nonpolar molecules. So the opposite charges are going to attract each other. We've mentioned Coulomb's law before. And this, this, bit at the biz, this bit at the front really doesn't matter. What we're interested in here is Q1, Q2 divided by R. So the potential energy, how attracted these particles are to each other, will depend on the product of their charges. And um, it will be inversely dependent on the radius. So we talked about this with magnets on the refrigerator, right? Really strong magnet is going to stick much harder, right? A weak magnet will not stick as hard. And then the distance, if you start putting pieces of paper between the magnet and the refrigerator, you're just increasing the distance a little tiny bit, but it doesn't take much, and now the magnet won't stick at all, right? So the force of attraction is greater when the objects are closer together, and it's also greater when the charge magnitudes are greater. So that's kind of a basic principle for all of these things. We spent two whole chapters talking about bonding. So bonding forces also involve large charges at very close distances. So here in this water molecule, we have a covalent bond. You maybe know a little more than that, more about that than you wanted to at this point. Um, but these are two particles, and they're sharing a, a pair of electrons. We've got positive protons and negative electrons and all this attraction here. And this is very close distance, so 96 picometers. Intermolecular forces are much, much weaker than actual chemical bonds. And this is because they occur at larger distances. So this is, you know, roughly 300 times, I'm sorry, three times, three times as far. And so distance can make a big difference. And also the magnitude of the charges here is less than what we were seeing in a, in a bond, even a covalent bond. So we're going to talk about these different forces. We'll start with the weakest one. These are called dispersion forces, also sometimes called London forces. Dispersion forces are present in everything, all molecules, all atoms. And these arise from a fluctuation in the electron distribution within molecules or atoms. So here, this is an illustration of a helium atom, right? Because there's two protons and two neutrons, and here we've got the two electrons. So we learned that electrons are, they can be particles, but they're also waves. And so when we think about this orbital, we're thinking about the standing wave that is those two electrons. But if we were to take a picture of it at any point in time, those electrons would have to be located somewhere. So here, they're on opposite sides of the nucleus. Here, they've moved around a little. They're still on opposite sides of the nucleus. But over here, now, they just happen to both be on the same side of the nucleus. So we have all of the negative charge on this side, and the positive charge is exposed on the other side. And so this creates an imbalance in charge, creates a dipole moment. 
And so we have partial positive charge, partial negative charge. Does that make sense? We just get lopsided. So at any given instant, the electrons in an atom or a molecule could be unevenly distributed. Okay? So this is called an instantaneous or temporary dipole. And when we have one of these, so here's this helium atom that just happened to get lopsided, it can induce a dipole in the neighboring atom. Because now we have a, a slight positive charge here, and that's going to attract the electrons on a neighboring atom. So they're going to come over here. And that's going to cause a dipole on that one, which is going to induce a dipole on the next one. It's a little bit like, um, if you imagine like going out on one of those cruise boats that goes out to Alcatraz in the San Francisco Bay, and um, you know, you got a lot of people and they're all just standing around on deck, and usually people are kind of spread out evenly, but then you get close to Alcatraz and you can kind of imagine, well, everybody wants to be on that side. Right? And that could cause the boat to tip or list just a little bit, right? And so maybe it's listing and it looks a little bit scary. And then the people on the next boat are going to come over and look at that boat because it's tipping, right? So that's kind of what's going on. The attraction between these partial charges is the dispersion force. These charges are very, very small and they come and go. I guess, any questions about that? So how strong that is, the magnitude, depends on how easy it is to push the electrons around in a given atom or molecule. Because to, f to have two dipoles next to each other, you need the one to happen spontaneously and then the neighboring one has to be induced, right? And so it has to be kind of floppy, and I think of it as sort of jelly-like, right? And so the electrons can, can slide around. And so what we see is that a larger electron cloud is easier to polarize. because those electrons are held less tightly by the nucleus. So we observe that the dispersion force is generally going to increase with molar mass. So if we look at the noble gases, as we go down the group of noble gases, they get larger. Their molar mass increases. And we cannot measure the dipole force directly but the melting point or boiling point of the substance is going to depend on the, the intermolecular forces. These are atoms, and so the only dis force they have pulling them together is this dispersion force. So helium boils at 4.2 Kelvin, which is very, very close to absolute zero. And as we go down, the boiling point increases until xenon boils at 165 Kelvin still super, super cold, but this is significantly higher than 4.2. So as the molecules, sorry, as the atoms get larger, their electron cloud is larger, right? And it's just kind of flabby, right? And it can get pulled out of shape. So if this one sees a dipole next to it, it's going to get pulled out and cause an instantaneous dipole in itself. And then they'll be attracted to each other. And then it'll disappear. The shape of the molecules has an effect here as well. Here we can look at two different compounds that have the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms. They have the same molar mass. This is n-pentane and this is neopentane. So this has um, a more linear structure and this is more sort of spherical, right? So in order for the dispersion force to attract these, they have to get close to each other. And so the surface area has a big effect. 
Here, these two linear molecules can get close to each other along their length, and so you can get a much stronger dispersion force there than with the spheres that can only touch at one point. And again, we can think about Velcro, right? So if you had Velcro on two long objects and they, there's a lot of Velcro that can connect, that's gonna hold really firmly, right? Have you seen those bouncy things where you put on the Velcro suit and you jump and you stick to the wall? How does a person stick to the wall when my shoe won't stay done, right? Well, it's because you've got a lot of surface area sticking. Whereas if you just have one point, it's not going to stick very hard at all. Does that make sense? Any questions? This slide we're uh, comparing uh, boiling point to molar mass in a series of hydrocarbons. We see as the molar mass gets larger, the boiling point goes up. The boiling point becomes higher because the molecules are sticking together better. You can only use um, size to predict dispersion force if the things that you're comparing are similar. These are all similar to each other. The noble gases were similar to each other. We can't use something like this to compare pentane to helium. Uh, that doesn't work. But we should be able to answer questions like this. Which halogen has the highest boiling point? What's the biggest one? Which is the biggest? Iodine. As you go down in a group, they get bigger, right? That's the one that makes sense. Going across getting smaller is the one that seems backwards. The next type of intermolecular force is called a dipole-dipole force. So this happens um, between polar molecules because polar molecules have permanent dipoles. It's not that the dipole comes and goes, it's always there. And so these dipole-dipole forces are going to be stronger than dispersion forces because they're always there instead of fluctuating a lot. So this is present in all molecules that are polar. So here we see interaction between two polar molecules. The negative end of one polar molecule is attracted to the positive end of the other. Polar molecules also have dispersion forces. They have those in addition to dipole-dipole uh, forces in addition to the dispersion forces. So if we're comparing here um, a nonpolar molecule, all carbon-hydrogen or carbon-carbon bonds, all nonpolar bonds, and here we have Oxygen is different than the hydrogens, and so this is going to be not symmetrical, and it's going to be polar. But if we look at the masses here, 30.03, 30.07, really, really close. So we're comparing a similar molar mass because we don't want the effect of dispersion forces changing with mass to come into this. And then we look at, um, say, boiling point. For the polar molecule, it's negative 19.5 degrees Celsius. For the nonpolar molecule, it's minus 88. Nonpolar molecules will boil at a much lower temperature because in order to boil, they have to have enough energy to break free from each other. And if the forces holding them together are not very strong, that happens at a lower temperature. This is showing the effect of boiling point as a function of dipole moment. Remember, that's a measure of how polar these molecules are. So we see with a higher dipole moment, we have a higher boiling point. And again, here we're comparing um, compounds that are similar in, in size. 
The polarity of molecules is important in determining miscibility of liquids. So miscibility, that might be a new word. It kind of sounds to me like mixability, which is not a word, but makes a little more sense. The ability to mix, right? Miscibility is like miscibility. Do the two liquids dissolve in each other or do they separate like oil and water? So the phrase we use is like dissolves like. So if you have two polar compounds, they will likely be miscible with each other. If you have a nonpolar and a polar, they will not. If you have two nonpolar compounds, they will likely be miscible with each other. Here we're looking at Pentane and water, this is all carbon-hydrogen bonds, a nonpolar molecule. And here we have water molecules that are polar. And so the water molecules are very strongly attracted to each other. And so they're like, oh, yeah, there's you. Okay, but these guys, oh, I like these guys. And so all the water molecules are going to just click together like magnets, right? And that's going to push the nonpolar substance out. If this was also a polar substance, then they would have that common dipole and they could be attracted to each other. So you could think of it a little bit like speaking the same language as well. Right? If you have a group of people and everybody speaks the same language, even though they're from different places, they're probably going to mix and mingle just fine. But if you have two groups of people and they don't speak the same language at all, they're probably not going to mix with each other just because it's so hard to talk to each other, right? So like dissolves like. You should be able to answer questions like this. Which molecules have dipole-dipole forces? Okay, what kind of molecules have dipole-dipole forces? Polar or nonpolar? Polar. So we're looking for polar molecules. Well, we've got Ci4, and I wrote that out. This is carbon tetraiodide, so you don't think it's just four chlorines. And then we've got CH3Cl. And then we've got HCl. So just kind of sketching out the skeleton structure without really finishing the Lewis structure. Is, is carbon going to have any lone pairs? No, carbon never has lone pairs, right? So then if all of these atoms are the same and there's no lone pairs, it will be nonpolar. That's my shortcut rule, right? So. This is bonded to four iodine atoms. Those are all the same. They have the same electronegativity. So is that going to have dipole-dipole forces? No, it's only going to have dispersion forces. What about this one? Is this polar or nonpolar? It's polar. No lone pairs, but the chlorine is different than the hydrogens. And so one end is going to be more negative. So that could have dipole dipole forces. How about HCl? Polar or nonpolar? Polar. Two different nonmetals, right? So that could also have dipole dipole forces. Any questions? Here we're looking at a molecule called acetonitrile, um, and this is an electrostatic potential map, and we see that we have a negative end here and a positive end over there. And so this is asking us, well, how are two acetonitrile my, bleh, let me say that. How are two acetonitrile molecules going to interact with each other? Which of these uh, um, interactions? would likely pull them together. 
So it's the nitrogen end that's negative and the hydrogen end that's positive. So do we want the two negative ends to be together? No, we want negative to positive, right? Well, how about A? Is that what we've got going on here? Yeah. So it looks like that's probably the correct choice. Here we have the uh, negative ends kind of overlapping each other. Is that going to go very well? No, they're not going to like each other very much. Here we've got one at a right angle to the other. It's not going to be really much attraction there either. And here we have the negative ends close to each other. That's going to repel. So this is how they're going to interact. The negative end of one will be attracted to the positive end of the other. Any questions? Third type is hydrogen bonding. And this is really just super dipole-dipole force. It is a dipole-dipole force, but it's just like extra, extra strong. <clears throat> this is found, again, in polar molecules, but only certain polar molecules. They need to have a hydrogen, hence the name hydrogen bonding. If it doesn't have any hydrogen, it can't hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Why those three? These are very small, very electronegative atoms. So a hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, fluorine, or hydrogen, nitrogen bond is especially polar. Those partial charges are larger. These um, attractive forces, the hydrogen bonding, are stronger than regular dipole-dipole forces because those partial charges are large and because we're dealing with small atoms that can get close to each other. So we've got Q1 and Q2 being larger, and we've got R, the distance between them, being smaller. And so this is going to be stronger. So here we've got hydrogen fluorine, and so this is um, this delta negative is uh, larger than in a, just a regular polar molecule, and so these are guys are going to be attracted to each other. So the hydrogen bond is this force of attraction between the molecules. So we need to know which kinds of molecules are going to have hydrogen bonding. Have you seen the movie E.T.? It's really old. This is a really cute movie. And what, what did E.T. want to do? Bond home, right? Phone home. I know it's a little bit of a stretch. So if you have hydrogen bonded to one of these, F, O, or N, that molecule can have hydrogen bonding. ET phone home, right? Here we're looking at hydrogen bonding in ethanol. Here we have hydrogen oxygen, right? That's one of those. Hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Well, here hydrogen is bonded to oxygen. So this can have hydrogen bonding. And so the hydrogen bond will be between the slightly positive hydrogen of that hydrogen oxygen bond on one molecule and the negatively partially negative oxygen on a neighboring molecule. It's just a force of attraction between them. Water also has hydrogen bonding. Water has hydrogen-oxygen bonds. So the hydrogens will be attracted to oxygens on other molecules, and that holds them together. Here we're looking at it with space-filling models. This bond here between hydrogen and oxygen is a covalent bond that includes hydrogen, but it is not a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is an intermolecular force. Any questions? So hydrogen bonds are between molecules. Intermolecular means between molecules. Intramolecular would be within a given molecule. So hydrogen bonds are intermolecular forces. They're between molecules. 
chemical bonds, like we spent the last two chapters talking about, are between atoms in, a sa in the same molecule. So hydrogen bonds are only 2 to 5% as strong as covalent bonds. They're very weak. Here we're going to compare a polar compound that has hydrogen bonding with a polar compound that does not have hydrogen bonding. Okay, here, this oxygen in the middle has lone pairs on it. Do we have carbon, sorry, phone home. There's an oxygen here, and there are hydrogens here, but is the oxygen bonded to a hydrogen? No, it's bonded to carbons. We really should show this to you a little better. They're kind of assuming. So there's oxygen there, but it's bonded to carbon, not to hydrogen. And you have to have fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen bonded directly to hydrogen. What about this one? Well, we got the OH at the end, right? And again, so these carbons are going to have hydrogens on them, and then there's an oxygen and a hydrogen at the end. So this is ethanol and this is dimethyl ether. Their molar masses are the same because they have the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. But dimethyl ether boils at negative 22 degrees Celsius, so it's a gas at room temperature. And ethanol boils at 78.3 degrees Celsius, so it's a liquid at room temperature. This has the stronger hydrogen bonding and so you have to get to a higher temperature before the molecules have enough energy that they can break loose. Questions? Hydrogen bonding is like really, really important. Water's boiling point is actually extremely high. If we look at the other period two elements, I'm sorry, the other group 6A elements, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, they're going to form similar compounds with hydrogen. And we can see a trend here in boiling points. Right? The higher boiling point is the larger molecule because it has stronger dispersion forces. All of these are polar. So we would expect that water's going to boil down here, but it boils way up there. And that is because of hydrogen bonding. It has super dipole dipole forces that hold it together, and so it has to get much, much hotter before it will boil. Here we see um, a similar thing with the group four. Um, again, we ex kind of have a trend here. Um, but methane, CH4, doesn't do the same jumping up thing that water does, because methane is nonpolar. And it doesn't have ET phone home. It doesn't have hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So if we didn't have hydrogen bonding, all the water on our planet would be gaseous. That would change life a little bit, right? In fact, life wouldn't be possible because our bodies have a lot of water in them. There's another kind of question you should be able to answer. Which of these has a higher boiling point and why? So we've got HF and we've got HCl. And understanding whether these molecules are polar or not is important. And the questions that I give on exams, my shortcut rules will always work. 
So here we have diatomic molecules, just two atoms. So if the bond is polar, the molecule is polar. Are these bonds polar? Yes. I would expect you to say yes, even without looking at a table of electronegativity values, because hydrogen and fluorine are different nonmetals. Hydrogen and chlorine are different nonmetals. If I gave you something like chlorine gas, is that polar? No, because they're the same, right? So, so that one's, that one's going to be nonpolar. So both of these are polar, right? So they all have, everything has dispersion forces, polar or not. These are polar, so they have what kind of intermolecular forces? The second one. Dipole, dipole. It's the interaction between two dipoles. And then we need to check and see, well, does either of these have hydrogen bonding? Yeah. We remember ET. And this has a hydrogen-fluorine bond. If fluorine is bonded to hydrogen, that molecule is going to have hydrogen bonding. So this also has H bonding, hydrogen bonding. Is stronger attraction is going to make the boiling point higher or lower? It's going to make it higher because those molecules are going to have to wiggle a lot more. They're going to have to get to a higher temperature to break loose from those attractions that are holding them together. So this has the higher boiling point because it has hydrogen bonding and the HCl does not. There's um, a fourth type of force, and I don't think it should be called an intermolecular force because it's not between molecules. This is the ion dipole force. It is an important force, though. This is the interaction between an ionic compound and a polar compound. So this is really important when ionic compounds dissolve in water. So here we have chloride ions and sodium ions from sodium chloride, and the chloride is going to be attracted and attract the positive ends of the water molecules. So they're going to just kind of flock around it, and here sodium's going to attract the negative ends, and they're like, oh, we like each other, we like each other. In order for this um, ionic compound to dissolve, in the solid, these guys are touchingly close. They're positive one, negative one charge, and they're right next to each other, right? And in fact, they have other uh, atom ions alongside them. And so in order for us to get these apart, you kind of have to lure them away. And so water's really good at that. Water will be whatever you want it to be, right? So chlorine, chloride is looking for positive charges, right? So water's going to show the positive side to chloride. And these attractive forces here are going to make up for what it lost by leaving the sodium. And here's the sodium ion looking for negative charges. And these attractive forces with the water molecules are going to make up for the attraction it lost with the chloride. It takes more than one water molecule because the, the partial charge on the water molecule is much less than one. So this type of force is stronger even than the hydrogen bonding. Any questions? So ion dipole is attraction between an ion and a polar molecule. Polar molecules have dipoles. Dipole dipole forces between two polar molecules, two permanent dipoles. Hydrogen bond is super, super dipole force, right? And then the first one was the dispersion forces. And there we have these spontaneous and induced dipoles. They come and go and come and go. And so that's very much the weakest one. So here's a table that kind of uh, summarizes all of that. You should know the order.
here that dispersion forces are the weakest, then dipole-dipole forces, then hydrogen bonding, and then ion-dipole forces. And these are, everything has dispersion, dipole-dipole is only polar molecules. Here we've got the ET phone home, and then here is ionic compounds and polar compounds. Which substance has the highest boiling point? So what we're looking for is, are these ionic, are they polar, are they nonpolar? And then we can see what kind of forces would attract them. Let's start with C, nitrogen. Technically it has a triple bond. Is that polar? No, it's two of the same atom bonded to each other. So this one's nonpolar. So what kind of forces do nonpolar molecules have? The dispersion forces. Well, let's look at this one. Carbon and oxygen. Polar or nonpolar? We would guess polar because it's two different elements. So this one's polar. And so polar molecules have dispersion forces and what? Dipole-dipole forces. So the forces holding the CO together, you know, molecules together, are going to be stronger than nitrogen. And if you calculate the molar masses of these, they are similar in mass. We're not comparing something that's got 300 grams per mole to something that's 5 grams per mole. These are roughly the same in size. And how about this one, CH3OH? When, when we see this CH3, that H3 means those three hydrogens are on that carbon. So we've got the carbon with three hydrogens, and then it's bonded to an oxygen and another hydrogen. Is that polar or nonpolar? Polar. If you look at carbon as the central atom, it has no lone pairs, but not everything bonded to it is the same. The oxygen is very different than the hydrogens. If you look at oxygen as the central atom, well, you might not recognize it immediately, but it does have lone pairs, and the things bonded to it are different. So this one is polar. So everything has dispersion forces. Uh, that doesn't look very good. Whoops. This is polar, so it also has dipole-dipole forces, right? Does it have hydrogen bonding? Yeah, it does. It's got this hydrogen-oxygen bond. Which one should have the highest boiling point? A, the one with the strongest intermolecular forces. Would there be something that C has to be so too? Or is it just not polar? Because I know you have a triple bond. Well, it, it has a triple bond, which tells us that the nitrogens in the molecule yeah. are very tightly bound together. But here we're looking at, well, what about between one N2 molecule and a neighboring N2 molecule? Yeah, so the dipole-dipole force happens between a polar molecule. So here's just a very simple polar molecule. It has one polar bond. This end is partially negative. That end is partially positive. So another molecule of that same compound is going to be attracted to it. The positive end of one will be attracted to the negative end of the other. And that's stronger than the dispersion force because the dispersion force is only there part of the time. It comes and goes. And the charges here are greater than on the dispersion forces. And when we get to the hydrogen bonding, that's also always present, and those charges are even greater. Any other questions? So the negative is always greater? 
No, the, the negative and the positive, I put these guys too close together, really. Let me move them apart. So we have this attraction between those. Um, in this molecule, the partial positive is the same magnitude as the partial negative. And here, the partial positive is, is the same as the partial negative. But if we look at something like HF, here, I'll make that bigger. Here, the partial, po partial negative charge and partial positive charge are larger because this bond is more polar. because the fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. So the difference in electronegativities is greater here. So one is more polar. One is more polar. And so like magnets being attracted to each other, stronger magnets are gonna hold together more strongly than weak magnets. Mm -hmm. And so this would be like a strong magnet and a weak magnet. We're not really going to be comparing um, polar molecules and polar molecules and trying to say, well, this one has more or less dipole-dipole forces. What we'll be comparing is a polar molecule that doesn't have hydrogen bonding to a polar molecule that does have hydrogen bonding. And here that HF, it, it is, there's two factors here. Fluorine is very electronegative and fluorine is very small, which means that a neighboring molecule can get up real close whereas chlorine is larger and so they can't get as close. Any other questions? We've all heard of DNA, right? DNA is important. DNA is held together by hydrogen bonding. So there are two strands in your DNA, right? And this is a picture of um, DNA replicating and so the two strands separate from each other and then new strands are formed that match these. So the G, A, uh, C, and T here stand for uh, thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. I'm not gonna quiz you on that. But thymine and adenine have hydrogen bonding with each other in two places and they just kind of click together like magnets. They're like really attracted to each other. Cytosine and guanine form three hydrogen bonds with each other. And so those will snap together. But cytosine will not be very attracted to adenine or thymine. And so we have these pairs and they're always gonna pair up the same. So in the original strand of DNA, we have A and T next to each other and G and C, well, across from each other, really. When we separate these, here, I've, here we have an A without a partner. Well, the only thing that's gonna come in and stick to that is a T. And here, this T, another A is gonna come in here. And so this is replicating the strand that it got separated from. And so you end up with two strands of DNA that are the same. And it's because of hydrogen bonding. Any questions?